Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to our session. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I realize uh, there's uh, free drinks after this, uh, so we're going to try to keep you entertained until then. Um, we'll talk about supercharging your mobile game with uh, YouTube. And uh, I would like to introduce my co-presenter, Corey, from uh, Unity. Um, he uh, is working on uh, Unity implementations with a number of partners. Uh, so I wanted to start with this uh, photo that I found on the internet. Uh, as you can tell, it was taken a while ago. Uh, there's a, a few uh, really excited uh, mobile gamers. Uh, this photo was taken at a gaming convention in uh, Vancouver, Canada. The question uh, that popped into my mind when I saw this is, what would it take to excite and energize uh, your gamers, your players, your customers, uh, equally today? <clears throat> well, if you look at uh, some stats, um, there was a study done uh, two years ago, and 95% uh, of gamers that spend significant time playing games uh, watch user-generated content on YouTube. Uh, so these are gaming clips. Actually, the number for trailers is 94%. So more people watch uh, user-generated content than the highly produced um, gaming uh, trailers. In fact, there's several companies already taking advantage of this trend. Uh, so uh, some of these titles that I'll show you will probably be familiar to you. Uh, Trial Extreme 3, uh, FIFA 13 has uh, video upload uh, capability, so you can share your gameplay uh, directly from the game. And then uh, the granddaddy of them all, uh, Talking Tom. Uh, this is an application that has really uh, taken great advantage of uh, video sharing. So in that app, you can create a video. It's uh, both a, a nice virtual pet a type of app as well as self-expression platform. Uh, so this is what we'll uh, talk about today. Uh, we will show you how you can take a sample Unity game uh, that we built uh, for this purpose and then integrate YouTube API in order to share the gameplay uh, with the world. YouTube has one billion users, so there's a billion potential customers out there. Uh, and then um, we will show you both the upload and playback capability, how that can be integrated into a Unity game. Uh, so really, the only thing you have to do as a game developer is focus on building a great game. That's it. So uh, first, I wanted to show you uh, a little demo. Uh, of the game that uh, we have built uh, for this purpose. So here's my game. And uh, the objective of this game is to shoot these gas cans as fast as possible. And I am pretty bad at it, as you can tell, but I'll try to do my best. One more. Oh. Got 12 points. <clears throat> All right, time is up. Um, so the next step, um, you know, I just had this wonderful score of 12 points. Uh, I would like to watch myself play this game. So here's the replay. Pretty amazing. I rock. So what I do next is, uh, well, I, I definitely want to share this uh, gameplay on YouTube. So I'm going to hit the YouTube button and let this processing uh, take place. Um, what this means to you is imagine you were playing an awesome game, some sort of a war feed simulation and with, with your best friend, and you just blew up his or her Abrams tank. You can share that achievement on YouTube, and then they claim the bragging rights for the rest of the week. Now. I would like to introduce Corey, who will take you through the process of creating games uh, with Unity. And then uh, he will discuss some of the uh, plugging uh, opportunities that exist within the Unity framework. After that, uh, I'll take you through the process of actually integration between YouTube APIs and Unity. So over to you, Corey. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Corey Johnson. I am a field engineer at Unity Technologies. Uh, this is Unity circa last fall. Uh, there I am, just in case you were doubting me. Uh, I'm going to take you through kind of like what uh, Unity is, um, what, what we're about, and then kind of give you an overview of our editor, and just so that way you have some context when uh, Yark talks about his plugin later. 
Uh, I apologize uh, if you already know Unity. It's, we're just going to stay high level, but I'm going to go really, really fast. And if you don't know Unity, I apologize because we're going to go really, really fast. But uh, myself and my illustrious colleagues are in the sandbox on the third floor in the Android section, so please feel free to follow up. So what is Unity? Well, we're a cross-platform engine. Uh, we come with an editor, which is a tool to create 2D and 3D content. Um, we believe we have the best tooling in the industry. Uh, we believe that we give you a rapid learning curve and rapid iteration times. We have a mantra of build once, deploy anywhere, meaning we're, again, multi-platform. Our mission statement is to democratize game development. And that means that we want anybody out there who wants to build a game, whether an artist or an engineer, to be able to build a game. Um, and that attitude has led to our tooling, and it also led to a, an enormous community, which I'm going to talk about in a second. When I say everywhere, I just kind of quickly define that. Uh, we're currently at like 13 different platforms and more are on the way. Uh, we even have Union, which is platforms that you may not even know you want to be on yet that we help get content to. So uh, as you can see, uh, we're fairly prolific, and if you want to be there, we're probably there for you. A little bit about our community. 1.8 million people uh, use their product, 400,000 monthly actives uh, every month, 5 million hours of creation every month. It's enormous, uh, from, every, from the hobbyists all the way up to the AAA studios. Uh, one of the things we did to democratize this is build an asset store, which is a marketplace for our users to share content, whether it be uh, tools that they built in our customizable editor that they we just didn't uh, get to, or if it's awesome artwork that you know people need. So, like for me, I'm an engineer. I can't do art, but I can go in and buy awesome environments or a night to run around my game. Uh, one of the Features that we use is called native plugins. Um, we're going to talk a lot about it today, so I just want to kind of give you an overview of what they are. So Unity uses mono for scripting, so that means you can run your game scripts uh, across platform. But what plugins let you do is call native code to whatever platform you're on from your game scripts. For this talk, we're going to focus only on Android, um, and I will point out this is a pro feature. So first, uh, there's two ways to do plugins. Uh, the first is Java, or sorry, the first is native, and the second is Java. They're actually interchangeable. Um, I'm going to talk about native first, and then a little bit about Java. So here is an example of some code that's like C code that's a minimal plugin. All it does is return a value. Um, all I need to do is put this C file uh, and build it into a .so file uh, using the Android NDK. And I need to place it in my projects plugins folder, which I'm going to show you in a minute. To call that code, and that code could be doing obviously a lot more complex things, all I need to do is from my game code, uh, use interop services, annotate my plugin or my function definition, and then call my code. That simple. For Java plugins, um, it's, it's a little bit different. We use the JNI to interact with your Java class that you build. Uh, you can build it a, a jar file using Eclipse in the Android development toolkit. Again, you just build a jar that contains all your classes, make sure you check the is library button, and then place that inside your plugins folder. We provide, because you have to do some uh, work with the JNI to you know, discover your methods and then invoke them, we provide some wrapper classes, the Android JNI and the Android JNI helper. And then on top of that, we built another layer of helpers, which is Android Java object and Android Java class, which allow you to uh, not only automate the whole process, but we also cache those lookups so subsequent calls are a lot faster. So instead of showing you Java code for the plugins, I'm actually just going to show you an example here. Uh, and then Yarek's example is going to show a lot of Java code. So on this slide, the two lines that you see that are not commented out are what you need to do to invoke uh, to make a call to get this hash code string. All the commented outlines are what you would do if you had to do that natively. So it just kind of gives you an example of how much work we kind of save for you and how much prettier your code can look. That's about it with plugins. What you do with them is up to you. Here's some pro tips. When you're dealing with Android, and obviously you have the, the whole world of the, the native platform at your fingertips, you can do things like add activities and re do things with stuff that we don't re normally request permissions for. To do, so in order to use that, you obviously need those in your Android manifest. Now, usually we generate one for you, but you can take that and modify it, add whatever you need, place that in your plugins folder, and just drop it right next to it, and we will automatically use that one instead of that way you don't have to rebuild it every time. One thing, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for future users, customers, whatever, teammates, 
you saw that there was some work, you know, annotating your function definitions, you know, making the JNI calls. It's really easy to just drop in another uh, code file that does all that work for you and just exposes the raw API as you want your, the users of this to actually, the plugin to actually see. Um, we are dealing with native code and, uh, I'm sorry, managed code in, uh, in, the, in your user game scripts. When you go down to the native level, obviously you're native, and we have to marshal that data, any data that you want to deal with back and forth. So be aware that there is some penalty costs to this, so you may have to weigh uh, the benefits of where you want to do the work. We're talking a lot about video today for obvious reasons. I just want to point out some function calls that we're going to use later um, and what they do and explain them a little bit. Uh, the first is on render image. This gets call is a callback to you so you can uh, basically react to whenever all the rendering is finished for your render target. Um, this means that everything is done, and in this case, normally what we do is Michael Bay up the screen like here and add some bloom effects and lens flares. Uh, all we need to do, to do it for to get a replay is to just copy the frame. Similarly, on audio filter read gives you a chance, every time we read a piece of audio data that we're going to send into the audio processor, you get a chance to custom, like customize. You can squelch it, make yourself sound like Darth Vader, whatever. Again, in this case, all we're doing is using that opportunity to copy that data so that way we can encode it later. When you're dealing with a plugin that deals with your frame time, you're going to want to be able to sync up your, your plugin work when you're going to get the frame um, versus, you know, when Unity's rendering, because you don't want to grab any frame data in the middle of when it's writing to the frame buffer. Wait for end of frame is uh, an object you can yield to in your coroutines, and that will make sure that you, when you come back and that code executes, you're at the end of the current frame, um, and that just helps keep all the syncing together. Cool, I'm going to switch over to the editor now. Awesome. So this is the Unity Editor. This is where you're going to build your game. The first thing I'm going to talk about is our project window right here in the middle. The project window is where is literally a mirror of what's actually on disk. It's all your models, meshes, textures, sound files, etc. cetera. Uh, you can literally go and look at it on the file system, and it's going to look exactly the same. You'll see here I have this plugins directory. Plugins is one of our reserved words. Um, we look for that folder and then treat things in there as plugins so we know how to build them into your final uh, game. And then you just say, I want an Android. As you can see here, we have a custom Android manifest. And then we have some, a bunch of libs that we're going to talk about later. So not everything in there is going to end up in your final build of your game. On the left here, we have a hierarchy window, which you can see here to the right of my screen. This represents everything that's in, represented in our drawn screen. So if I select my wall here, I can move it up and down and break his game and do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and here's where you build your layout of your game and, and all that stuff. So we are a component-based engine, which means that everything in our game engine is an object with components that add behavior. So over on the right, we have the inspector window. Whoa. All right, sorry about that. I will just proceed. Um, the inspector window shows us uh, all the components on there. So you can see that, I didn't do it. All right, one second. And we're back. Uh, currently, I have the uh, wall selected. We can see that as a mesh, it's a mesh render, it has some animation to it, it has a box collider, so things will be, and all these do is tell the engine different things and have different widgets where we can customize how our engine reacts to these objects. If I select our main camera, we'll see that we have uh, a bunch of scripts attached to it. Now, to get custom functionality into your game, you create uh, scripts. Our scripts, again, are mono, so it can be C-sharp, JavaScript, or Boo. We ship with mono develop, so you have everything you need to develop a game um, already installed. Inside here, we have, oops, looks like I picked the audio one. Uh, that's fine. Inside here, we have the on audio filter read, and you can see all we're doing is checking to make sure that recording is active, and then passing that data to a convert and write function. Uh, 
Uh, similarly, we have a similar function for video where we have on, on render image where all we do is do a little bit of logging and we are making a copy of our, the frame buffer. I mentioned earlier they have rapid iteration times. At any time, you can hit the play button located at the top of the screen there. And we go ahead and allow you to play your game and test it out. So I can test out the force of the tennis balls that we're shooting out, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome, so that's a little bit, so you have uh, when Yarek's in there later and showing screenshots, you kinda know what you're looking at. I'm gonna pass it back to him now so he can talk about, maybe. Here's the trip. All right, me, yeah, I'll uh, do it. Oh yeah, there we go. All right. Okay, thank you, Corey. Uh, so Corey took you through the process of creating a game with Unity, and if you're a uh, Unity developer, then really the only thing that uh, uh, is, might be new for you is the uh, way you integrate plugin capabilities. If you haven't tried Unity yet, um, I encourage you to try it out. It's a lot of fun. Um, now, uh, what I'll cover next is, okay, now uh, how can we integrate video upload and video playback capability into the game to really take advantage of, of the opportunity out there that we highlighted earlier? Uh, so uh, first, let me switch back to my uh, demo. And uh, you know, the uh, gameplay that uh, I was showing you earlier when I scored an amazing amount of uh, points, um, I actually ready to share it. I think it's really awesome. Uh, I'm just gonna hit upload. And uh, at this point, we're actually uploading the uh, video uh, to YouTube. I'm actually generating a notification uh, to show the uh, status of the upload. Uh, while that is taking place, uh, let me walk you through what actually <coughs> happens. So uh, for this, uh, we are using WebM as a video container, uh, VP8 codec and uh, Vorbis uh, codec for video and audio respectively. Uh, tomorrow morning, there is a talk about uh, VP8, so if you would like to learn more, uh, hi highly encourage you to check it out. And we're also launching uh, VP9. There's another talk about the next generation of this uh, technology. Uh, but let's just take a step-by-step -step look at what is involved here. So uh, we start with this uh, awesome Unity game. And then uh, what we actually need to get out of the game engine is the audio uh, and the video frames. Um, so this is what uh, is illustrated on this diagram. Uh, we're getting the video frames, passing them onto the VP8 uh, encoder. Uh, we're getting the audio frames uh, passing to the Vorbis encoder, and then use the WebM container in order to create a, a video file for us. Once that file is created, uh, we use the YouTube data API. In this case, we use the YouTube data API version three uh, to upload the resulting video to uh, YouTube. The YouTube data API is RESTful. Um, it's fairly straightforward to use. For Android, we use the Java uh, client libraries. Uh, so you don't actually have to write any HTTP, uh, HTML, uh, H, uh, HTTP uh, JSON parsing code. Um, now, uh, in our example, uh, we built a Unity plugin in order to take care of the uh, video upload uh, from Unity and the video uh, encoding. Um, couple of hints uh, while developing the plugin. Uh, Corey mentioned uh, the Android manifest is something that uh, Unity generates uh, by default since it actually uh, creates the APK. Uh, however, if you're building any additional activities uh, in your code or need additional permissions, uh, you need to merge that into uh, the manifest created by Unity. So the way to do that is uh, first time you build a game in temp staging area, you'll get a uh, Android manifest and then uh, you edit that and copy, copy that over into the plugins directory and you are all set. Uh, another thing to pay attention to is that uh, plugins are actually required uh, to be built as Java uh, Android libraries. Uh, so um, uh, you actually need to be careful about uh, resource merge. And uh, really the only thing that is uh, somewhat inconvenient is that if you're used to the uh, ID-based lookup in your code directly, uh, uh, inside of the uh, plugin while you're running in Unity, uh, you should actually use the uh, functional way of looking up, or the procedural way of looking up the uh, resources. Other than that, it's just you know, regular uh, Android development. Now, 
Uh, Corey mentioned some of the uh, methods involved in uh, video and audio capture, so I'm just going to quickly go through uh, what we did for this demo. Uh, so we actually attached a camera, uh, two scripts to the camera, one script responsible for video capture, the other script responsible for audio capture. Uh, so let's start with the audio. Uh, we are actually capturing uh, the audio at 24 uh, kilohertz frequency, so this is uh, um, the uh, raw PCM data that you're going to be receiving in your application. Uh, you can actually configure that using audio settings, output sample rate. So this is something that you can configure uh, in Unity. And then for video, I'm just using 10 frames per second right now. Uh, there, Unity has a nifty feature. Uh, you can actually set the replay uh, frame rate, and this is different than the actual uh, target frame rate at which your game runs, uh, precisely for this use case. So if you want to record a video of the game, you can actually set the capture frame rate uh, to whatever makes sense. And there, you, you do operate within the number of constraints. Uh, that we'll touch upon a little later. Uh, so for audio recording, uh, and Corey, ha Corey highlighted that uh, when he pulled up MonoDevelop to show you the snippet of the code, uh, we use audio filter read. Uh, so this is the callback that it's invoked by Unity uh, at the frequency that you define uh, using the mechanics from the previous slide. And what's passed to you is really raw PCM audio. Uh, and this is what we'll pass on to the uh, encoder. Then um, for video, uh, and this is, again, something that Corey highlighted. Uh, the continuation here, uh, yield return new weight for end of frame, uh, that allows you to be notified when uh, frame is rendering is fully completed, at which point you can actually turn around and read the complete frame back. And there's a number of approaches to this. Uh, I'm actually, uh, uh, we experimented with a few of them. Uh, they all have different trade-offs. Uh, here's one. Uh, so this is the approach where I'm actually using Texture 2D uh, to read back pixels uh, at a resolution defined by you, uh, so you can actually uh, generate a video at a lower uh, resolution than the original. Uh, and this is, again, if you want the video file to be relatively small so you can be shared uh, from mobile devices quickly, you can actually read uh, the frames at uh, smaller resolution. Uh, another approach is to use the GL read pixels, so you can read it uh, directly from the frame buffer. Uh, using the OpenGL uh, GL read pixels. And this is an example of uh, another implementation uh, that I did <coughs> uh, using Java. So that is actually invoked from within the uh, Java plugin to obtain the uh, frame buffer. Um, so that's the um, capture step. Once the, um, the frames are captured, so the raw audio, raw video, uh, we need to encode it. And for that, uh, we're actually using uh, WebM and uh, VP8 plus uh, Vorbis for audio. So let's talk a little bit about how that is done. And again, just referring back to the, our reference uh, diagram, we actually at uh, that stage right there in the middle where uh, we obtain the raw frames, we are passing it on to the encoder. So um, one thing that is uh, very useful uh, on Android is uh, our uh, WebM engineers actually have created uh, JNI uh, bindings for uh, the encoder, both the um, Vorbis encoder uh, as well as the VP8 encoder, uh, and you can fetch that uh, from uh, code.google.com. Uh, <clears throat> that is a JNI wrapper. It has dependencies of, uh, on a few of the native libraries, but this is what actually provides you a really nice uh, performance. And this is what we used um, in our application. Uh, so a couple of things to uh, consider when you're actually using this. So think, think of this as kind of nice, you know, object-oriented way uh, to do video encoding. So if you're not comfortable writing C code, uh, but you're an Android developer, you know Java, well, now you can encode video, um, and, and you can do that very easily. So let's just walk through the kind of basic building blocks. Uh, audio encoder, there's a couple of classes, the encoder configuration and the actual encoder. A video encoder. Uh, again, the configuration and the actual encoder. And then uh, the WebM uh, maxing capabilities so that, so that you can write the compressed audio and video frames uh, to a container and then end up with a single file. Uh, so, and here's an example how, how this uh, looks in practice. So we start with a byte array, which is basically the PCM audio uh, that was um, uh, given to us uh, by Unity as a part of the uh, script attached to a camera. And then uh, similarly for uh, video, uh, we read that video from the ba uh, frame buffer. And then we construct 
<clears throat> ultimately, what we want is the audio frame and uh, encoded packet, uh, which basically represents the encoded audio and the encoded uh, video. And the way that is obtained is uh, we actually pass the row um, audio bytes to the Vorbis encoder, pass the row video bytes <clears throat> to the VPN encoder, and then uh, we use the uh, maxer to uh, save the audio and the video frame. Uh, that takes care also of synchronization, so you don't really have to do uh, any work in, in that area. And what you get back uh, is a video file. So here's a, uh, an overview again of, of the objects that we just discussed. So encoder configuration, both for video and audio, the actual encoders, uh, the tracks representing the audio and the video part of the WebM uh, file and the maxer. Uh, so this is kind of the, the way I see it as an object-oriented way of doing uh, video uh, encoding. And I, I, I really like it because I think it's very approachable. Uh, so uh, for those of you that would like to do a little bit more work in this area but have been um, intimidated by you know, having to deal with a bunch of uh, native code and the large uh, libraries, this kind of provides a, a, an abstraction that is very easy to use. So once we have the video and audio, uh, the only thing remaining is the actual upload. Um, and the way we do that is using the YouTube Data APIs. I'm using the YouTube Data API version 3. Um, so in order to access that, you need to register your project in the developer console. Uh, one thing to note is we are uploading the video into the user's account. Uh, therefore, we must obtain an auth permission uh, from the user for our application to ask, act on his or her behalf. And the way that takes place, there's a little bit of magic involved. Uh, it actually works uh, very nicely. The only thing you need to know about is that when you register your uh, project uh, in the developer console, you need to supply a fingerprint uh, for, the develop for the key that you're going to be signing the application with. And uh, you have to tell Unity to use a specific key store, a specific key, uh, to sign your APK. And once you do that, everything just works uh, like magic. So we know uh, on the server side, so our APA back, API backend knows that, hey, this is your application that is generating these requests. So you don't actually have to uh, change any code for this. Uh, and then um, the upload process, what I was showing you, a couple of, of hints. Uh, you know, don't block the user uh, waiting for the upload. Uh, you can just uh, do that as a... Uh, service and then uh, use a notification to uh, indicate the progress. And then uh, use resumable uploads because if you lose connectivity, uh, which is in fact, in fact very likely uh, at Moscone Center right now, uh, this uh, should actually resume uh, automatically. Uh, so here's a, uh, one video that I created a little earlier. Let's just play it. So, um, and then let's check the, I'm going to switch to the um, mobile device. So, um, remember the notification that I was popping up as a part of the uh, uh, video upload uh, right now indicates that, uh, hey, you know, my video has been successfully uploaded. Uh, watch the video on YouTube. So uh, when I click it, uh, let me just select it. I can see the uh, gameplay right in, the, in my game. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how that is implemented as well. But before that, just a quick note uh, on authorization. Um, I mentioned to you that um, uh, we use uh, Auth2 in order to upload the video uh, on behalf of the user. And uh, to implement that into, in your Android application, you can use the uh, Google Play services. So we're using Google Auth Util. It uh, makes it very straightforward to implement the Auth flow. Uh, and really, the only thing you need is the, uh, you need to remember the, about the scope that you're going to be requesting from the user. Uh, so in our case, um, I'm using YouTube Read Only because I need that in order to uh, check on the upload status, and I'm using YouTube Upload, which is going to grant uh, my application the right to upload videos. Uh, uh, and that is reflected uh, here by this uh, pop-up that is generated by the auth uh, for Google Play services. 
And then uh, I was just showing you a while ago how the playback in application playback works. Uh, so uh, you know the reason why uh, that is useful is uh, earlier today uh, you have uh, learned about uh, the um, uh, new uh, uh, capabilities that we're launching in the gaming area. Uh, so you know personally I think uh, leaderboards and achievements are very cool, uh, but you know I, I want a video to prove it. Uh, so this is one use case uh, that you can implement is you know if you have the upload capability you could associate or keep track of these achievements and leaders and show you know the most interesting footage uh, from uh, your users uh, in the app itself. And for that, uh, you can use the uh, YouTube Android Player API. Uh, so this is uh, an API that we launched uh, a few months back. And as I was showing you earlier, uh, it has the capability of you know, high quality in-app uh, video playback. Uh, there's very little work that is required in uh, making that uh, happen in your application. Uh, really, all you need to do is uh, drop in this uh, library here, YouTube Android Player API. Uh, this is a small uh, client library that actually relies on our YouTube app uh, to do the actual video playback. So it's a very robust, it has all the capabilities that you see in the uh, YouTube app, uh, and you can make that available inside of your own app uh, uh, that is uh, running uh, inside of your Unity game uh, using the plugin capability. A uh, couple of things to, to note, uh, the YouTube Android Player API requires a developer key that is a slightly different than the dev key that uh, uh, we used uh, for the all of uploads. Um, and then uh, we may prompt you uh, to actually upgrade the YouTube app uh, on the user's uh, device. So uh, if the uh, app is um, out of date, uh, because the user hasn't updated it or it's not set for automatic updates, we actually uh, generate this error service version uh, update required. Typically that doesn't happen, uh, but this is how we can make sure that uh, the latest capabilities or back fixes are actually made available to the user uh, when they try to use uh, our YouTube API to do uh, video playback inside of your Unity game. And then, uh, you know, our transcoding pipeline takes a little while, especially if it's high quality video and we transcode it to a number of different formats. Uh, YouTube Data API v3 has this nice capability. You can actually check the uh, processing progress in order to find out, you know, is this video ready to be shown on all the platforms that YouTube support. Uh, so I highly encourage you to actually do that before you do, say, social sharing. So I was requesting GPlus permission in my auth uh, uh, flow earlier, a few slides earlier. Uh, and the use case there is, you know, once I'm done with the uploading, I want to share it with the world. But share it only once uh, processing progress indicates that the video has been uh, completely processed because that means it will play on every single type of device uh, that YouTube supports all the transcodes uh, have completed. Uh, so a few links. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about our APIs, go to youtube.com slash dev. Uh, this is the link to the repository that um, uh, hosts all the JNI uh, wrappers for WebM, VP8, uh, Vorbis, and uh, libyov, which allows you to do RGB to YOV conversion, which is again a uh, little detail that uh, we, don't, we didn't get into too much uh, during this talk. Uh, and then we are working on polishing up this uh, demo app, and then uh, we're planning to open source it as well, so you can, you can try it out yourself. So, uh, you know, we hope that uh, this capability will uh, excite your users, now it's 2013, so I figured someone playing a tablet game would be an appropriate way to uh, conclude this presentation. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, please come up to the mic, we have a few minutes left. Um, so this will do a record as, as the user is playing the game, right? So uh, what's the impact on the performance that you, that you expect on the device? Because gaming already consumes significant horsepower on the on the platform, and yeah. then if you're going to record at the same time, yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, what is the performance uh, impact of this capability? Actually, the way uh, this demo app is implemented, uh, we are uh, using a trick where the uh, gameplay uh, recording is not happening at the same time uh, as the game. Uh, so I am actually doing a replay. Uh, using the Unity uh, 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 capability where you can actually tell it to render frames at certain speed. Uh, so uh, there is no um, impact while you're playing the game. However, when you're actually ready to share it, depending on the device and depending on uh, how 
uh, how you configured it. Uh, for example, if you want you know, HD, uh, uh, if you want high quality video, because you, those are parameters you can pass to the encoder, then the actual rendering of the frames may or may not keep up with the frame rate that you get when you're playing the game. Uh, so the, uh, there is an additional step uh, that uh, involves basically rendering the frames one by one. And at low resolution, uh, low frame rate, uh, right now, because I'm using um, a, a pretty uh, expensive way to fetch the frames from the frame buffer, uh, at low resolution, I can keep up uh, with the frame rate of the game. At high resolutions, I can't. However, uh, that doesn't really impact important the gameplay, but uh, it impacts the replay. Ideally, what we would want, uh, and you know, we have a couple of partners uh, that uh, do that uh, for other platforms. Uh, in fact, there's one in the sandbox, and one of them spoke uh, earlier today at the, uh, as you see, uh, raising his, his hand. Um, uh, so there's other approaches to that. Uh, they don't currently work on Android. Uh, so that's, uh, this is an alternative uh, that can be used. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get to that same level uh, of performance. But there isn't really, the impact right now is zero because the step of rendering the gameplay is dis dis distinct from the, uh, from the play. So you also said uh, VP8 and going forward it could be VP9. Uh, again, uh, does the developer kind of pick a codec there, whether it's going to be VP8, VP9, or is it, YouTube that de yes. decides. Uh, so the question is, you know, what does what does it mean now that we have VP9, VP8? So the good news is, is you don't really care. So uh, frankly, uh, as long as you give us the content in any of the formats that we support for YouTube ingestion, we actually turn around and transcode it in everything imaginable that is required uh, by all the devices that we support. Uh, so we chose VP8. And we're going to get into that uh, into more details uh, tomorrow is because this is open source royalty free codec. You don't have to pay any, anybody any money. You don't have to pay any royalties. You can do whatever you want with it. And it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a very liberal uh, license uh, and it's open source. So uh, we, f we find that this is a good fit uh, for these types of uh, applications. Uh, the way YouTube works is once you upload the video, uh, we'll actually take care of transcoding into the formats that are supported by different devices. So if a target device uh, for playback only supports uh, H.264, we'll use that transcode. Then our Android player API, which I demonstrated earlier for playback, uses one of these transcodes. Uh, so it really is totally transparent to the uh, developer. The only thing you kind of have to know is, you know, all these codecs have specific requirements. For example, VP8 requires a YOV, YOV representation of the data. That's why we have libYOV also wrapped, so you can pass the RGB data that you get from the frame mapper, uh, convert that to YOV, and pass that into VP8. So there's a little bit of knowledge uh, that is required, but I would say it's pretty minimal. So you answered part of my question with respect to, say, uh, transcoding. Now, for recording, I assume it could also be H.264, or, uh, because most of the devices, they don't necessarily have support for VP8 HD record. Right? So yes, so we are using a software encoder right now. Uh, so uh, the way this application is built is the actual uh, VP8 codec, Vorbis uh, codec, WebM container uh, is shipped as a native library wrapped uh, uh, through JNI and packaged in the Android plugin that is integrated with the Unity. So everything required to render uh, the video is included uh, in the game itself. Uh, Android has the capability to actually use the uh, underlying hardware, hardware encoder and that is typically H.264, though. Uh, and, and again, this is something that uh, tomorrow's session is going to go into more detail. You know, the world there is, is also becoming uh, uh, more attractive. Uh, but uh, you don't actually need to. Th the nice thing about this approach is there is no dependency on a specific device or a specific version of Android uh, because it's just uh, C code that you compile using NDK and then the uh, JNI uh, wrappers. Uh, and it's also very small. Thank you. All right, so we have 20 more seconds left. Uh, if there are, uh, oh, there's one more question. I, sure. Uh, I wasn't in, from the beginning. I just want to ask, can we record the normal Java screen? I mean, the application screen. Yeah, so the question without is, Unity and yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, you know, can you can you record the applications? Uh, screen, and uh, uh, I believe the answer is, uh, for, for an arbitrary app, uh, the answer is no, and typically 
uh, it's because of sandboxing requirements and, and whatnot. So uh, that's why you know, this is something that has to be built into the uh, application itself. And this is really how you yeah, know, well, for PC uh, games. What are the uh, mechanisms for building? Yeah, so uh, in this session, we actually uh, describe how that can be done with Unity. And the mechanism for that is Unity has uh, integration points to obtain the raw audio and the raw video frames. And this is what is actually passed into uh, our encoder and uploaded to YouTube. Uh, but it's application specific. So YouTube, uh, um, Unity has this capability. Uh, it relies on uh, the GL uh, uh, capability. So this is something that is app specific. Okay. And if, if this is not clear, uh, I'll hang out after this. Uh, we can, uh, we can, we can, we can uh, go in more detail. All right, so uh, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, please rate our session. Thank you.